After his awakening, the Buddha surveyed the world. And the first thing that struck him was that people's minds are on fire, on fire with greed, aversion, delusion, lust, fear. These things are constantly smoldering away in the mind, and then they flare up. That's why one of the images of the goal that he teaches, nirvana, actually means the, the extinguishing of fires. Back in those days, there was the belief that there was a fire element and you could provoke it. The potential for fire was there in everything. And if you provoked it by in those days, they didn't have matches, but they would use fire sticks. It would provoke the fire element, and when it disturbed the fire element, it would latch on to fuel. And as long as it was latched on to the fuel, it would keep burning. And the interesting thing about it was that it was trapped by its own latching on. The fuel didn't trap the fire. The fire was trapped by its own latching on, by its own clinging. When the fire let go, that's when it was released. The fire element would return to a state of calm, peace, coolness. So that's the Buddha's basic image for what we're doing here as we train the minds, is trying to get these fires and put them out, to free the mind from its attachment to the various kinds of fuel that it latches onto. Because even though we think that things outside provoke lust, greed, and anger, the potential for lust, greed, and anger is there, just sort of waiting in the mind, ready to pounce on things and latch onto them. So what we have to do is learn how to let go, and it's our letting go that frees us. Like that chant we had on the body just now. Really there's nothing wrong with the body. It's just the fact that we latch onto it in so many different ways. We latch onto our own bodies and then like them or dislike them because they do or don't fit in with our image of how they should look or how they should act. And then we latch onto the bodies of other people through lust. And so we have to learn how to find ways of thinking that help pry our fingers off of these things so we can let go. So with the contemplation didn't notice the unattractive side of the body as well. The Buddha is not saying the body is a bad thing. After all, if we didn't have bodies, we wouldn't have anything to, to function in life. But it's just that we focus on the wrong things, and it provokes the lust in the mind. So first he asks you, focus on the unattractive side of the body. To the point where you get to wonder, why would you ever want to feel lust for this, this kind of stuff? But that doesn't mean the lust goes away. It's just it's the potential is waiting there in the mind. But he wants to focus you next on the lust in and of itself. What is this potential in the mind? Why does it want to go out and latch on to these things in this way? Basically because it's hungry. So the Buddha has you develop better food for the mind. Focus on the breath and allow the breath to be comfortable. Comfortable coming in, comfortable going out. Try not to put too much pressure on it. Just stay right next to it. In John Fung's word, Brakong, is a Thai word that means that you kind of hover around something and hold it very gently. Or well, the classic image in the text is of holding a baby chick in your hand. If you squeeze it too tightly, it's going to die. If you hold it too loosely, it's going to fly away. So you have to find just the right amount of pressure so you can stay with the breath and not put undue pressure on any part of the body. And when you get this sense of just right in staying with the breath, it's a sense not only of ease but also of fullness. This is where you begin to get food for the mind feels like every little cell in your body is just full of itself. 
every potential for sensation has a nice fullness. It's not being bothered or pushed around by the process of the breathing. And then you think of that sense of fullness spreading out to fill as much of the body as you can. And then learn to stay with it. And John Fung used to say there are three steps to the meditation. One is learning how to do it, how to get the mind settled down. And the second one is learning how to maintain it. They're two separate skills. They're connected, but they're different. And since, in the sense that once you're there, you've done what needs to be done to get the mind to settle down. And then the next question is, how do you maintain that? How do you maintain that sense of balance? in the midst of all the other distractions there may be, either coming in from outside or welling up from within. And you find all kinds of thoughts will come in. There's boredom, impatience. What's next? Why can't I think of something else? No, don't think of anything else. Just stay right there with the breath and allow it to do its work. If you're going to feed the mind, it takes a while for the nourishment to soak in. When you give it that opportunity, then after a while you are ready to go on to the third stage, which is to use the meditation, use the concentration. In other words, once you've developed this sense of fullness, that in and of itself doesn't solve the problem, because the mind could at any point drop its concentration and go back to its old ways. So you have to learn how to compare the sense of ease and well-being the mind develops while it's here with the breath, and then the pleasure that it gets out of giving into lust or aversion or greed or whatever. But you've changed the the playing field, because you've you found learned to find more pleasure in the state of mind that's not involved with those things. So it has more strength in learning how to resist the pull, their pull, and at the same same time begin to understand why is it these things have this pull over us? Why does the mind want to get angry? Why does it want to get lustful? We're really more attached to our desires than we are then to the objects of our desires. You see this all the time. You want something and then learn you can't get it. And for a while you feel frustrated, but then you decide you want something else instead. And some of the things you get, some of the things you don't. But the mind's tendency is always to keep wanting this, wanting that. If it can't get X, it's going to go for Y. Now if you're told it can't have X and it can't have its desire for anything else either, the mind would really rebel which shows that it's not so much attached to X as it's attached to the, the process of desire. And then when the desire is frustrated, that's when the anger comes out. These things are all connected. So what the Buddha does is give you better things to desire, stillness of mind, and understanding of what's going on in the mind. And this practice of concentration so that the, the path is not just a dry intellectual exercise, that it really does feel not only physically, not only mentally fulfilling, but even physically fulfilling. There's a sense of fullness just in the body. It feels good just sitting here with the breath, with the different parts of the body undisturbed, just allowed to be still right where they are. And in that stillness, you can start seeing the process of how these different defilements arise. We don't like the word defilement. It's funny in the West, there are certain Buddhist terms that just haven't made their way across the Pacific Ocean yet. Every time they get sent over, they get sent back. And defilement is one of them. We don't like to think of our minds as defiled. But once the mind gets still and luminous, you begin to see greed, anger, and delusion is just that. They're clouds that come and cloud your mind. They make things murky inside because you can't see anything clearly. Well, how does that process happen? 
how to let these things take over. When the mind is still and you ask this question, you're much better positioned to see. You see these defilements not by giving in to them, by learning to say no. This is when you begin to understand the currents in the mind. It's like learning about the currents in a river. One of the best ways to do that is to actually build a dam across the river, try to stop the river, and see which parts of your dam get washed away. Rivers may look very placid on the surface and yet still have very strong currents deeper down. And if you just look at the surface, you'll never know. Or if you flow along with the river, you'll never know. But if you try as an experiment, say, we're, we're going to put a dam across this river, we're not going to flow along with the current, that's when you learn about the currents. It's the same way with the mind. You decide you're not going to give in to its old tendencies for greed, anger, and delusion. You're going to try to stay right here with the breath. And the more solid your concentration gets, the more clearly you see the force of these currents where they spring up, why they spring up, and why we decide to go along with them, and also how we have the choice not to go. That's when you really start seeing interesting things in the mind, is when you decide not to go along with the current. You catch it very quickly, that point where the mind says, yeah, let's go. But this time it says, no, let's not. And you see the current go out, but you're not going out with it. Because you're not going with it, it doesn't go very far. And this ability not to get pushed along or swayed by the currents, that puts you in a much better position. Even though you still haven't gotten rid of the potential for defilement, you're in a much better place because you have more control over whether you're going to go with these things or not. And ultimately, you do see where they come from and how you can stop them for, for good. So this practice of concentration really changes the balance of power in the mind. Puts you in a stronger position and gives you a much wider sense of the alternatives that are available. As often we think, if you, if you don't give in to lust, don't give in to anger, it's going to get bottled up, and then it's going to come out in weird ways in other directions. And so we feel obliged for our own mental and physical health that we've got to give in to these things. That's because our understanding is that we only have two alternatives, either give in to these things or repress them and get all screwed up. But the Buddha is offering another alternative. He's Get the mind in a state of good, solid concentration, where there's a sense of ease, there's a sense of fullness, and you don't need to feed on these things anymore. When you don't feed on them, you don't get pushed around by them. And whatever force they have, it can just go right through you without you feeling obliged to either latch onto it or fight it back. This is one of the reasons why one of the images of practicing is getting, in, getting onto an island. In other words, you're in the middle of the river, the current flows past. You see the current flowing past, but you don't have to flow with it, because you're standing on solid ground. That puts you in a much better position, both to escape the force of the current and understand where it's coming from, where it goes. So we've switched images. First it was the image of fire, and now it's the image of a current. Current of water, then it's an image of standing on solid ground. But whatever set of images you use, whether it's learning how to put out the fires of the mind or get out of the currents, in both cases the meaning is the same. It means freedom.
freedom from the way the mind has allowed itself to be enslaved, freedom from the way it's constantly kept in the dark. Freedom from all the agitation. Freedom from its own clinging. And when you taste that sense of the well-being that comes from that freedom, and you look from the whatever pleasure or happiness you got out of giving in to your defilements in the past, you don't see any reason why you'd ever want to go back to your old ways. So that's where this practice that we're doing, staying with the breath, getting distracted but coming back to the breath again and again and again, and getting a sense of learning how to relate on good terms with the breath. This is where it all leads. It leads to freedom. So stick with it. Learn how to do it, learn how to maintain it, and learn how to put it to use.